highlighting some of our successful Georgetown alums and kind of looking back at their time here at Georgetown, what they've done since, and what they're up to now. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over now to Richie, who's going to introduce our moderator and guest today. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just take a minute to introduce our moderator really fast. Um, Tony Arin is a professor and associate dean uh, for graduate and faculty affairs in the School of Foreign Service. Uh, he is an expert in the fields of international law, national security law, human rights, and terrorism. Um, he has previously served as a senior fellow at the Center for National Security Law and currently a member of, of the uh, Council of Foreign Relations. You might have seen him on TV before. Um, you might also have seen our guest on TV before, frequently making appearances. Um, uh, Mr. Epstein is a is Epstein. the director. Epstein, excuse me, I'm sorry. Epstein, Epstein. Epstein. Uh, is the director of communications uh, for the presidential inaugural committee. Um, or the PIC, um, and a senior advisor um, to the Trump-Pence transition. He was a uh, senior um, advisor to the campaign. He was a communication aide to the McCain-Palin campaign um, and a media surrogate for the Romney-Ryan campaign. Um, he's a double Hoya, graduating from both our SFS and our Law Center. Um, he's a Republican strategist, an investment banker, and an attorney with expertise, and expertise uh, in international law, finance, and bankruptcy. Um, he provides regular analysis, as you might see, um, on topics including uh, presidential campaigns, international affairs, political strategy, legal issues, financial markets, the economy, and more. Uh, he's been involved in researching and writing uh, numerous publications um, with the Georgetown Journal of International Law. And aside from his very impressive professional resume, um, he's a great friend of GU politics. Um, he was kind enough to come uh, visit us at the Republican National Co uh, Convention in Cleveland um, and talk to us. He also phoned in on election day. Um, he made some pretty oh, that's accurate. That's right, I forgot about that. <laughs> I had, <laughs> well, I had a very specific question for you. I said, when is the night going to end? And you said, you're going to be very surprised in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And I did not believe you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How does that call? It was like free laugh, free journey. Well, so, so if you didn't believe his predictions now, you better listen up. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, um, our first hipster event of the year. Take it away. All right, thank you very much. And Welcome everybody. Let me welcome my, my former student friend Boris back to the hilltop. Yes. And, and I want to note two things. One, I taught Boris for two courses, and he was an extremely good student, and he's an exceptionally articulate person. This past summer, I seem to see him on television every single moment. I'd put on the TV, and there would be Boris. So he's, he's a face that has been in my living room. And that's now great to have him in our living room. This is awesome. Isn't it cool? Isn't it cool? I, this wasn't around when I was No, 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 no. The, the Healing Building's a recent addition to Georgetown. It didn't exist. They put it on a new building. I graduated in about 1786. Uh, you knew, you knew John Carroll. Yeah, this so, right. so, guy. Trump's <laughs> more. Well, on that note, what, what we want to do is I want to give everybody maximum time to ask questions of Boris. But the first question to you is really, so you were born in the Soviet Union. That's right. Tell us a little bit about your story. What was it brought you to the United States? Sure. What brought you to Georgetown? And what was your Georgetown experience like? Oh, that's a great question. And a great honor and wonderful to be here with everybody. So thank you for having me, Professor Dina. And thank you. Tell me, tell me. No, it's all right. <laughs> old, old, old habits, old habits die hard. Um, actually, the first time I started studying under Dina was in the Georgetown High school program for yes. high school juniors yes. when I was here, so it's been a uh, it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride and a wonderful friendship um, that I'm that I'm very very appreciative of. So I'll give you all my story uh, as quickly as I can. You can expand on it uh, and then go from there. I'm, I'm here to answer any any questions you have. Would be nice. So I'm originally from Moscow, Russia. We came here in the early '90s with my family. We're Jewish refugees from the former Soviet Union from Moscow. So we. Have, went through that process of application uh, and then ended up here uh, in the early 90s, in 1993, in, uh, in Brooklyn, New York, in Bensonhurst, New York, with my family. At that point, it was my, it was my uh, parents and my grandparents on my dad's side and my grandmother on my mom's side. We lived in a very small apartment in Bensonhurst, in Brooklyn, but we were very happy and uh, together, uh, and, that, and that matters a lot. So from there, I went on. My father was a scientist, so we moved out to Princeton, and my father uh, worked uh, at some company, at, at a few organizations tied to Princeton University, and then we stayed there. And then I went to middle school, high school in Princeton. Then I went to, and my dream, my dream, dream, dream was always to go to Georgetown, specifically to the School of Healing Service. Yes, and I'm not just saying that. 
And the reason is because when we came over in the 90s, obviously, Bill Clinton was the president. Yes. And no matter where your politics lie or, or are, obviously, mine are on the other side of the aisle now, I've always had great respect for President Clinton. And at that time, that was the only president I knew. He was you know, the, the person who uh, we came over to, and I really admired him, and him being a graduate of the School of Foreign Service was so important to me, and is now. I'm, I'm very proud of being graduate of the same one of that school as he is. So uh, I went and did the Georgetown School, Georgetown High Program for High School Junior. What's that called, the Georgetown? International Relations Program for High School Students. For High School Students, the, 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 summer, the summer junior program. It was wonderful. I had an absolute blast, great class. I actually got some credit for it, uh, for two courses. So it was nice, two four credit courses that, that summer. I still remember that. And it was a, a great time. I lived in, uh, I lived in uh, Darnell, uh, went to Yates. Had a great time uh, and it really fell in love with Georgetown. So that was between my junior year and senior year. My senior year of high school, all I wanted to do was come to Georgetown. And I played football in high school. I talked to the football team here. We had some discussions. And then I ended up not being accepted to the School of Foreign Service. And I will never forget it. I got the call, and my grandfather, who was a, uh, who was a history professor in the former Soviet Union, uh, you know, he was very involved with my, even though he didn't speak any English, he was very involved in my process, as was my whole family, for application. And I called my grandma, I was bawling, I was crying my eyes out, and I was so upset, and uh, not to have gotten into school for service. And that night, I went to a banquet event for my football team, for you know, it was the end of our football career at, in high school. And the coach, who was actually, uh, speaking of Brzezinski's nephew. Milk Bennett. Yes, Bennett. Coach B, Coach Brzezinski, said to me, you know, don't worry about it, I'll bet I'll see you on CNN someday. Isn't that funny? That is funny. That's that's funny. funny. That's so funny. I ended up going to Swarthmore, uh, and I was there, Swarthmore University, Swarthmore College, a great school, uh, and Dean Gallucci, who's now back here, right? Yeah, he's teaching at yeah. Force. Yeah, so yeah. Bob's back. So uh, he was there, he came to speak, and I went up to him and I chatted with him, and I said, you know, it could be I'd love to transfer. Long story, long story long at this point, I ended up here as a sophomore, uh, and I never looked back. And, um, you know, I am an unbelievably huge supporter, advocate, fan, of this school, of this university. And then I, so I came here as a sophomore, I studied under Dean Aaron, uh, and a, a lot of other wonderful, wonderful, wonderful professors. Had a John Pertle. Yeah. yeah. Um, had an absolute blast. Keith Herbenak, who some of you may know. So, so some really good people. Um, and then I went on to law school here. And I actually, as a senior here, I met my wife, who was a freshman, and now we are married, have a wonderful baby. So. So, you know, undergrad here, law school here, which by the way, if any of you are thinking of law school, you cannot do better than Georgetown Law. It's a unbelievable, it's a wonderful school, a strong school, uh, and, uh, and the, by far the best school in Washington, D.C. So I did that, and then when I, you know, I did the legal law things. I was a lawyer at Milbank Tweed, had, had me McCloy, a great law firm on Wall Street. It was a bank finance law. Absolutely hated being a lawyer. It was just sort of a boring thing, and I, I, I did not love it. Um, uh, and I, I knew that it wasn't going to be for me long term. And, uh, and but what I did do is so then I started in 07. The, then then that, that season's campaign ramped up. So I got involved with the McCain campaign early on. I picked him as my horse. Back when Ruby, uh, when, um, Ruby Giuliani was still very much in the race, Fred Thompson and Mitt Romney were all in the race. But I said, I think McCain's going to get it. So got involved with McCain late in those, about December of 07. Then he won the primary. I ended up putting together his initial town hall at a federal hall event, uh, and then I went and I worked for the campaign in communications in D.C., and I was with, with the Palins in Alaska, which was an interesting opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I really value it, and uh, I got to know great people, including the Palin family, pretty well. So that was 08, uh, and then I came back to the law firm, couldn't stand it anymore, and then I remember talking to you, and I thought I'm talking to Professor Joyner at the right, time. Right, right. Uh, another great, great professor since passed on, right? And, and a friend. So I was giving <clears> advice on what to do, where to go with it. So I ended up uh, leaving the law firm, joining a boutique investment bank. I bought it, and I joined, I merged it with a second one since. Uh, and then in 12, I was a surrogate for the Romney campaign. What's a surrogate? Someone who speaks on TV is officially blessed by a campaign to speak on TV. I did the Bill Maher show, and some very good across the country. So 12 went, we obviously lost, so I was 0 for 2 at that point, which, you know, the, the president-elect has joked with me in the past, and you, now you're 1 for 3, good for a baseball player, not good for a politician. Um, <laughs> three, 330, I'm batting 333. So, 
And then, you know, the Rami campaign was done. I went back to my business. I grew it. I uh, started, I did more TV and then I really ramped down the TV. I stopped doing that. I was really focused on, on, my, on my business and my family. And then in 2000, about a year and two, three months ago, as the campaigns were ramping up, I actually went to, well, Eric Trump went here. Eric's a graduate. And I think some of you met with, maybe met with Eric during the, uh, uh, the Republican National C uh, Convention in Cleveland. So we've, we've stayed in touch. We were friendly in college. I ended up going to his wedding a couple of years ago and stayed in touch. And then I obviously, once President left, uh, you know, started running, I stayed in touch with Eric about that as well. So we continued, uh, you know, there's touching base here and there. And then I had a conversation with my wife, a 2007 graduate of the college, of George Knight, of, of the college here. And then she said, you know, she goes, you're either going to remember this campaign season as one you were, took a part in, you, you had a role in, or one you sat out. So mm -hmm. give it a thought. So I ended up getting involved, getting, getting doing a lot more TV, really ramping up, and then I went from being a Trump supporter to a Trump surrogate to a senior advisor, and um, here I am now. Uh, so that's uh, that's sort of my quick story. The, the, it's, it's such an honor to be the communications director for the presidential inaugural committee. It's really a blast. And, uh, I'm here to talk to you all about that and whatever else you want to. So let's open it up to questions. Thank you, Boris. Let's open sure. it up to questions. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Grant. Um, What's full, up, Grant? Full disclosure, I was the president of Players for Hillary. Um, so yeah. No. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my first question is now that we're in this, you know, that's happening, um, and we have president election, I'm going to give him, you know, some chances to do what he says, to actually make America great again. I'm really looking forward to it. But what's concerning me is his performance yesterday at the press conference was a little, it's troubling because you know, people hope that you know, maybe the presidency moderates him, maybe it brings him into what a president, what we've always seen a president to be. But yesterday, yelling down CNN, it's Jim Acosta, that is, like, and he's calling CNN fake news. You have gone CNN a lot. I don't, do you think? CNN, well, <laughs> I've, I've been on CNN a lot, but uh, they, that, that was fake news that they peddled. There's no question about that. So let me start off. I'm, I'm, I'm the president. I'm the director of communications for the presidential inaugural committee. So, you know, I, I I'll answer the question, but in general, I'd love to chat with you about that. What's going on with it all? My own background. Um, but so your, to your question, the answer to your question is this: is that the 76 percent of Americans want to change in this country? 72 percent of them didn't don't trust the media, and 78 percent about didn't trust Hillary Clinton before the announcement by FBI. So. If you look at those numbers, and then you look at the authenticity of the president-elect, that those things combined are what caused for this election, which we won't do in the six electoral votes, the biggest spread since 1988. So, you know, as far as his press conference, which I thought was very strong, I thought he did a great job, and his interaction with CNN, you know, we, CNN and BuzzFeed published a story which is categorically false, and they themselves, Jake Tapper on CNN said, there's a lot of issues with this, and we, we, there's no, uh, you know, no, there's no truth fabric to it, and there's no um, verification to it. So, you know, the president left, like any American, so they can defend themselves. So, as as you look forward to past January 20th, what you should be thinking about, or, or you can think about whatever you want, but I'm thinking about is this: I'm thinking about the jobs created during the transition. Look at Carrier, Ford, OneWeb, Sprint. Those are the things that. That's why Wisconsin went for us. That's why Michigan. That's why Pennsylvania, because Americans, as they're looking out right now into their lives, into their future, what, are, what have they seen? So they've seen stagnation. We haven't had 3% GDP growth annually in this country in eight years. That's what we're concerned about. It's not an interaction between the president elect and, and, and Jim Acosta. You, you know, the original people can disagree. I think that CNN has been acting incredibly uh, irrationally in a lot of ways. Now, uh, does that mean everyone at CNN has? No. But are there really issues? Sure. But having said that, what I'm thinking about as we're planning the inaugural and beyond, I'm concentrating on the key issues. And what are those issues? It's national security and it's the economy. And to, in, in my mind, there's, there was never a question that the person to lead us on those fronts is the president. Thank you. And the question of uh, saving Carrier and some of these other companies by just massively funding them with government spending. Um, I know uh, a few other Georgian professors criticized the Trump administration for being very pro-business, but also believing in you know a lot of government spending could keep this. Do you think that artificial spending is a strong thing? It's worth it in the long run. We're just not going all novel thing. I guess. <laughs> if you want to do that, we can um, do that too. Um, <laughs> How do you to, to, to give you an economics, to give you the answer on the economy, I think 
the, the specifics on carrier and some of these others as well is that it's not government spending. Well, are those certain incentives, sure, but it, it's it, those aren't. It's not government spending for the companies to want to come back and put jobs back into our country. That's the companies making that decision on their own, and it's unquestionably a good thing. Let me ask an inaugural question. So as you look at these, so I've had occasion to attend a number of inaugural because I'm a very old man. And you're not that old. You're kind. As we look at the upcoming inaugural, how would you describe the themes? Sort of, you know, if we look at the conventions, we right. see certain themes. So what's the, the fundamental themes that you hope we will all be able to take away from the inaugural? The key message, and this all permeates from the president-elect and the one, is all about unity. And unity in terms of the message of let's all get work together to make America great again, make America secure, make America safe, make America comfortable. And unity in coming together. Oh, there he is. Hey, hey, hey Mo. Mo. Hey, friend. How are you, Mo? Good to see you. Good to see you. I want to interrupt the live broadcast. <laughs> Sorry. So we've had some fun on TV. Yes, we have. Um, so, and, and, but it's also about coming together as a country and out in this post politics, post election period. Because Americans, as I said, by, if you look at those numbers in the 70s, that's a huge cross section of Americans who wanted something new. And that's, what, and, and that's what's, what's going to be happening. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an inaugural that's not a coordination, it's an inaugural that's a work moment. We're, we're have a shorter parade. In, two, in 1953, Eisenhower had a I was not at that inauguration. <laughs> and a four and a half hour parade. We'll have a short parade, but a very representative one, nevertheless. We have over uh, 40 groups. Every branch of the military participating were 8,000 participants. The balls. In 2009, there were 10 inaugural balls. This time, there'll be three two official balls and one ball saluting the armed forces and the first responders, which is new this year. So we're saluting EMT, firemen, firewomen, and the, and the police. So those are the themes being united, working together, pragmatism. And putting America back to work and making sure we're a city on a hill one more time. And so it's all that it's all that messaging it's, that weaves itself together. But the other thing I'm, I think about a lot is the history, right? So we are sort of, we are weaving together the history with the future of America, right? Because when, at the moment, on January 20th at noon, when President-elect Trump becomes President Trump, Vice President Pence becomes President Pence, that is a continuation of a long history of this beautiful country. 200 years of history. You know the first parade was from Mount Vernon to New York for George Washington? That was the first in all of So we, we, are, we are falling in step with these historical moments. And it's very, I'm very honored and humbling to be a part of that. Uh, yes, sir. Um, so um, and, so and you're uh, currently the communication for the president's inauguration. I know uh, during the election you were a senior advisor to Trump. Mm -hmm. so, this election, and I guess post-election, there have been a lot of just bombshells uh, in the news that totally changed the days or weeks coverage. So I'm wondering, like, from your communications perspective, how do you all respond to that quickly, and either in regards to what happened just a few days ago, or to the various uh, like breaking news that happened throughout the campaign? That's a great question. So at the presidential level, we have a wonderful staff overall. Tom Barracks, the chairman, Sarah Trump, the CEO, and I'm so proud to have a great, great team of communications. Greg Roberg, the double, the double boy back there, is on my team. And and you have to be nimble. I mean, the communications in politics, in business, in crisis, you have to be, you have to be nimble. And you, but the key in politics, and we learned that, maybe we learned it again this year, is authenticity. So whenever you, were, if you're responding to some news that you weren't expecting, or you were pushing some messaging out, the key is authenticity. And that's what we have in this candidate, that's what we have in this president-elect. So that allows a lot of ease of a, res of a response and allows because you know who you're dealing with. It's not etch-a-sketch as it's been in some previous ones. It's not, you know, it's, it, th those moments are tough to deal with but when, when you have to decide, well, which side of the issue are we on now? But when you know, because your candidate is authentic, that makes it, 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 make, it, makes it easier to have those so solutions to have those answers. Um. Mr. Spicer recently said that uh, you know, he doesn't get a memo when Trump is about to tweet. And given that the news cycle can be so volatile, so if you're like, you know, planning on a certain message for a day, one of Trump's tweets can just change it on a dime and dominate the news cycle. How do you deal with that as a communications team? Um, or like, do you have any specific experiences dealing with that, just like a change of a news cycle on a dime because it's something Mr. Trump does? Well, I think the, the, the tweeting is wonderful. I think it's great. And I think it's, it's a 21st century way of messaging. And it's real and it's authentic and it cuts through a lot of the unnecessary middlemen, if you say, and it goes directly to the people. So, uh, 
is there other instances when the tweets change the news cycle? Of course they are, but that's the point. That's the point, that's the new way to reach people. And I think it's amazing, and I think it proved to be very powerful throughout the campaign and, and throughout the transition. So I think it's a great thing, I think it's a very powerful thing. Oh, and Forces at the uh, RNC as part of that group, so with Richie, uh, thank you again for meeting with us. And sure. I, uh, I, I didn't take you at your word when, when, you, when you told us those things, so we're, uh, we, we, we were really humbled by that. You were spot on. Um, but what I want to ask you, in the lead up to the inauguration, I mean, you and, and your communications team, you guys are preparing for what's about to happen next week, but you've got the confirmation hearings that are going on now, the, obviously the widely covered press conference, President Obama's farewell, there's so much going on kind of in this world right now. Is that complicating what it is that you all are trying to do? Does it kind of make it more fun? I mean, what, what's the impact on everything that you all are doing in preparation for inauguration when this is such a jam-packed, busy time on the Hill and in politics? Another very smart question. And <laughs> thanks for not believing me then, but believing me now. Um, <laughs> the way I see it is that we all have our lanes. So the transition has a great communication staff headed up by Jason Miller and Sean Spicer, right? So they are handling the confirmations. We handle them all. So we are on our lanes, but we are constantly communicating, in constant communication, making sure that we are together on the messages, together on the on the key points. So it, I, I, I have not found it to be overly difficult. Uh, you know, are there interviews that I do and then they'll ask me something about the cover, press conference cover? Sure, and then, you know, I, I'll make, maybe we'll make a comment and I'll be clear and honest. I haven't heard talk about the inaugural. So, Yes, there's a lot going on, and that's exciting, right? It's great that there's a lot going on because that means we live in in exciting times because nobody wants to be bored. So, you know, from the communications perspective, as long as there's as long as there's communication, no pun intended, between the entities that are handling the different topics, then it's easy to stay on the same page. I mean, on this day and age, it's you know, I probably have six calls right now, but I'll handle you know I'll, I'll deal with it then. But you know, you're constantly in touch because it's not as if you need to send a carrier pigeon to talk to someone. Uh, on the inaugural point, uh, I was just kind of curious, why isn't Charlie Brogan, the man who announced his presidential inauguration since Dwight Eisenhower, doing this inauguration when he was perfectly willing to do it? Why did you go with someone else? Well, Charlie's great, and, and we're going to be honoring him as an announcer and yeah. and Steve Ray was very strong to be doing it, so we're very proud to have him both be part of the, part of the events. Why isn't he the, the main announcer? Well, you know, that, that if you look at a lot of considerations for the performance, for the religious leaders, decisions and but you make sure you make sure you honor everybody uh, who's been a big part of it in the past and put your part of going for in the, into the future and that's exactly what we done. I said I saw your hand a bit ago. Um, yes, Steve. Don't be shy. Mm. Yeah. The clash guy. Uh, Flash guy already asked. Yeah, the oh, we did. Okay. Yeah, the, we're we're going to bring Levinson. All right. So, 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 so London calling will wait and go in the back. Yes. <laughs> um, I was just going to ask. At the inauguration, you've got a lot of different groups there with a lot of different opinions about the ceremony itself. So, how do you ensure that everyone's able to like enjoy it and sort of be safe and friendly and connected? Well, and safety is, is very important. So, the way the inauguration was organized, there are actually three s s different entities that go into planning it. So we're the Presidential Model Committee. We're sort of a startup business. We're a pop-up business. So we start on the wee hours on November 9th this, this year. We ramp up, we work hard, and then it's over after the National Prayer Service on the Saturday morning of the 21st. The two standing entities are the Joint Task Force, the JTF, and the Joint Congressional Committee of Inaugural Ceremony. The JTF combines in itself all of the security agencies and structural agencies, logistic agencies. So this has been designated a national special security event like the paper visit was. So there's nowhere in the world that people are going to be as secure as they are in this, in this city the week of the inaugural. So we're confident in that. As far as people voicing opinions, we have a first amendment in this country. And I'm a huge proponent of it. President elected, we honor it, we respect it, and as long as folks act within all applicable laws, rules, and regulations, it's their right to voice opposing opinions. But my hope is that when people come here from around the country or the world and they see the beauty of Washington, D.C., they, they see the history of the mall, and they really breathe America because of this here in D.C. They, cho they choose to join with us and honor this partisan transfer of power, this which is the bedrock of our democracy. So that's, that's how I'm looking at it. Thank you, Boris. Um, I have a question. Um, is it something I said? No, I didn't say that. Uh, Some people said they have a class. I know, and I was late, and I'm sorry. Uh, I know you're part of the inaugural committee, but as a general 
um, crushed in working with uh, President-elect Trump alongside people who don't have necessarily like different political perspectives. Like, you know, we should all be able to get along with one another and be able to reach a common goal. But people with fundamentally like different perspectives of who different people are based on their religion or ethnicity or their race, like Steve Bannon. How, as a Jewish man, I don't know if you still identify with Judaism, do you work? Do you work on like um, a daily basis with people like that? Steve Bannon is a wonderful guy who I know very well personally and consider a friend, <laughs> and I very much identify as somebody who's Jewish. And Steve has always been uplifting, optimistic, positive, and supportive to me. So whatever those stories that you hear out there are not true; they're just the left pushing a narrative. Um, so I've had the pleasure of working with amazing people throughout my career, my business, and the Trump campaign. Um, and I'm very proud of that, and I'm proud to be part of this. I'm proud to be been a small, small part of the Trump team, uh, and you know, a small part of this uh, presidential novel committee going forward. Just a question about working with and for Mr. Trump. Um, so, for folks like yourself, um, Kellyanne Conway, Sean Spicer, Steve Bannon, etc., um, we know Mr. Trump's personal feelings on email and how he doesn't email. So, just from a like a working standpoint. Do you, does your team, and do you all rely on face-to-face -face meetings, or will he text or DM you on Twitter? I mean, what is kind of like the, the inter-team communication like? I mean, so, so not to get into some of the process specifics, but what I will tell you is that, and if you guys want to pull up, by the way, just take the chairs if you want. Um, there's no lag in communication with, with then candidate, now president elect which is really, he's somebody who, if, if, if you need to sign up from him, and he's not someone who's uh, difficult, uh, you know, he's not someone who, who's not focused on working. He's absolutely focused on, and as far as the communication specifics, I'm not gonna get into those in terms of the exchanges, but trust you me, the 21st century is fully in play, and it'll uh, be at home in the, in the White House, starting January 20th. Yeah, um, it's just like, so, some of the question about Steve Bannon brought up something like, you know, you say like all these allegations are completely false and just something that the left has pushed, right? And as your communications expert, you know, you say you can quickly do that. Um, how, how do you, like, a lot of it is like, you're kind of deciding truth for a lot of people who watch this on like TV or Fox News or anywhere. You know, people watch this and they see you saying this and they're like, oh, okay, it's not true. Like how, when there is information that maybe you don't like or something, this is just like a hypothetical you don't like or maybe it's going against and you would say something differently. Like, how do you feel about that? How, like, There's nothing, you know, have I made a couple of missteps on TV and just said things that were, everyone does, you know, and like, none, none of us are perfect. But I have never said anything I don't fully believe. So me saying that comes from the heart. And if I didn't mean it, I wouldn't say it. And it's been my experience. And sure, it's a, politics is a tough business. It's a tough business with tough people. But, you know, some of these personal attacks that we've experienced, and obviously they're from the left because that's that's who you know that, that's where how the Clinton Democrats are. Um, that's fine, and that, that's their prerogative. That's that's their prerogative. But in terms of, I don't believe I'm I'm deciding the truth. This is the truth to me. This is the truth. And again, maybe reasonable people have different opinions. Sure, but it's mine. And you know, the, the beauty of America is meritocracy, right? We came here as Jewish refugees in the early '90s, and now I have the opportunity to have these opinions and voice these opinions and be part of the discourse. But all of you have the same opportunity. And you know, meaning now you're not all guaranteed to do it and to get there, but you have the opportunity to get there with hard work and over time and making relationships and, 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 and making certain choices. And I wouldn't be shocked to see any of you having the same conversations on TV, on radio, on Facebook Live, wherever it is, in a couple of years. I'm gonna ask an unfair question. What's next? Because the inauguration the one thing I can say with certitude is that the inauguration will be over, and as you noted, the committee will be dissolved. So what do you do next? And obviously, it's an unfair question. So um, I don't have an answer for you right now, but I'm here to serve. That's an answer for it. Let me try and get a different answer out of you. Where do you see yourself? If you were to continue on the Trump administration, where would you like to see yourself? Anywhere the president-elect. Would like to be sure that I guess. <laughs>
Actually, that is the right answer. If you guys are ever in that position, that is the right answer. Whatever administration. How did you transition from uh, financial law to communications? Uh, that's a great question. So, I've never fully transitioned. Um, you know, I still, as of now, own a boutique investment bank, for which I do uh, some more legal work. But as you look on your careers and your paths, because really a career connotes a job, but if you look at your paths in life, don't cut yourself off to anything. Because all of us as people, we have a lot of talents and we have a lot of opportunities. And for me, it would happen on the McKinney campaign. I, I came in with the background of being a lawyer. I ended up in communications and ended up learning under great people. One was Brian Jones. Brian was communications director for McCain and left the campaign, came back and headed up our Palin, what's called Palin Truth Squad, which is a group focused on any issues pertaining to uh, Governor Palin. He was my boss. And now he's working with me and my group at the Presidential Model Committee. So life has a funny way of, of turning. But the point is that that was an opportunity that was presented to me and that was really my start in communications. Uh, at, the, at the McKinney campaign, so it's definitely a uh, trial by fire. Go back to Georgetown for a minute, and since everybody here is a Georgetown student, and I guarantee that there will be people in this room who will be in public service sure. in any number of different ways, four, five, 10, 20 years from now, what was it about your Georgetown experience that was most inspiring and sort of helped put you into a life of service? I think there's something very special about being in, at the school, which is far not the best school in Washington, D.C., right? It's the best and the brightest in, in D.C. to come here and study, with all due respect to GW. Mm -hmm. For which we can't I'll tell you what that stands for. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> of the word wait list. Anyway, so, <laughs> but be, and I'm joking, but be that as it may, there's something very special to be here, to be here, to be here at the school. And studying under people such as yourself, who have given their lives to service. It's not public service per se, but it's service to students and it's service to the greater good and service to studies, to stu you know, study service to education. Um, studying under Harold White, uh, Rabbi White, was, uh, was, was, a, was, a, was, a, was very important to me. Uh, he was, I was very close with him. He actually ended up, he was officiating our, our wedding with Lauren and I. So, but we saw each other at his memorial service. We did, we did. And that's the, that's the circle of life. So the people you study with and under, the people you learn from are going to be a big part of framing uh, of framing the next step. It was a big part of that at Georgetown for me. And how involved the professors were with the students, again, giving themselves, giving their free time, their nights, their weekends to the students and, and, and really throwing themselves into being, again, I would say that's a service of the students in a lot of ways, sort of helping the students in, in anything they need in, in study and in life. Um, so that was a big part of it. Of course, at the School of Foreign Service, what do we talk about every day, right? We talk about service. Right. And, and, and you study it, and you study, <coughs> I study everything from, you know, the Bangladesh, uh, Pakistani, Indian relations, to international law, to law of the sea. Yes. Um, to, of, of course, you know, foreign relations law, a huge cross section. And, but in all of that, what rings, what rings through is the key role that public service plays and government plays. Now, does that mean we need to have big government, bloated government, absolutely not. We need to have smart government. And that was something that really stuck, stuck with me from Georgetown, from the undergrad, and very much from the law school as well. Uh, you're a businessman yourself, and you've made a transition into the public sector, seemingly. So, and I've always been in the favor of having business people come into government outside of this, how consultancy works, that's how you fix problems, going from the outside in. So how have you, how have you experienced this transition? Is it easy going from private to public? And if so, are people looking for your skills? And, and do you find it that you're being effective in the public sector, taking your private sector skills and working with those types of business teams? Good question. And the guy wearing a lot of fur with Amos. That's too bad yourself. Um, so, if you, if, it's hard. Right. Don't, don't, don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be all right. It's gonna be genuine. We're friends. Gonna We're friends. You're gonna We're love friends. it. We're good. Yeah. We're good friends. It's gonna be great. And and, and, and and for all of you, I will urge you to look up the old Winston Churchill quote about liberals and conservatives. Um, that I'm not gonna quote here, but when you go when you're done with this, look it up. You'll, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and that's not guaranteeing your futures, but I think it's, it's interesting. So, being in business is unquestionably important to 
to them being in public in the public in the in the public sector. Being in business allows you to cut through to the key of issues, to the to the key you know grain of any issue, of any point of any discussion. A lot of times, Craig will tell us if I'm in a if I'm in a meeting and somebody who's working with me is saying, well, and then I say, well, give me, you know, tell me what's going on. And they start about 30,000 feet, and they go, oh, bottom line, please, just the bottom line. Mm -hmm. and, and I use that I use that phrase a lot, bottom line, because that's what I think about. I think, what's the bottom line? What is the bottom line on, on an issue? Now, is it, does that mean that business is the answer to everything? No. And actually, the president-elect was the one that said, we're not gonna let people have dime streets, right? So the heart has to go a lot into what you your decisions too. It's not just about business, but those, you know, basic canons of business of making the right decision. And then we're a capitalist country based on, based on Adam Smith. And capitalism, what is it? It's, again, it's meritocracy in a lot of ways. So those, those you know, those sp specifics, those uh, lessons from business are very important. Very important. Kelly, time for one more question. Okay, one more question. Actually, I noticed that I think only the guys in this question so far, so very, very glad to meet you. <laughs> Um, my name is Victoria. My first exposure to you is actually to Bloomberg Live. Um, it was one of these like very fast sessions. It was very loud, intense. Um, and so when I came to hear you speak, I kind of expected the same sort of um, posturing. Um, but you're very relaxed here. So in what like what kind of posturing do you think is more effective um, when you're trying to get a message out? And now that's after the election. Are you just more relaxed because of that? <laughs> it's, good, it's good that I seem relaxed. I've gotten about three hours of sleep total the last week. Uh, By the way, he, he's, he seems exactly the same as he did as a student. Just a, little less, a little less hair. <laughs> uh, I, I won't comment on that. But, but otherwise, he, you, he seems exactly the same. You know, being a student here, and I'll answer quick, being a student here was such an unbelievable experience because the class is the international law class, right? So the class, well, those are one of the, what do you call it, 10 basic, um, the one of the requirements was a huge course. I think it was a double period. Um, yeah, it was, it was four credit course. Four credit course. Yeah. And, but it was all about discussion. And, and I always chose to participate. Yes, because sure. maybe I didn't do all the, read, all the readings. I'll be honest with you, maybe I didn't every time. But I, <laughs> but I did choose to participate because, because through that discourse, through that conversation comes learning. And so to your point, so the Bloomberg Live you saw was the one where there were kind of two guys interviewing me at the same time and shooting me. It was, was it the it, Vegas you debate? guys were like standing up at a small table. And there the were Las like, Vegas debate, right? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 and second of all, I think there's room for a lot of types of discourse. Now, that was the campaign. Mm -hmm. And campaign's a complex sport, man. It's a complex sport, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it's tough, and you're out there, and, but in the end, here's what I never lost sight of. If, if God forbid there's a war, we're all fighting in the same trenches. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all on the same, the same side. Republicans, Democrats, Independents, we're all Americans. And I really, and I know I must have seemed to come up harsh in some of these interviews. I never lost sight of that. And I've become good friends with a lot of the folks on the other, on, on the other side. Some folks who, you know, we really, I mean, me and Maria Cardona had battles on CNN. Mm -hmm. I saw and we're, and we're And we're very friendly. Very friendly off air. How are you? How are you? How's your family? Story, everything. Because then we're all there. So it's this is not. I said this. This is not the campaign anymore, right? This is about now going forward. This is about right now. It's about the transition, about making coming together as a country. And then January twentieth at noon, it's about governing. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have to treat this as you have to treat it with that respect. And I will tell you, the first time I went on television after the election, speaking now on behalf of the president elect, it was a very special moment. Again, for that Jewish kid from Russia who lived in a tiny apartment in Brooklyn and studied hard and got into the school he loved. It's very special. And I'm very humbled, very humbled by the whole experience and humbled by being invited to speak to you. Because that's something that, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when I was in your shoes looking up at some of the events I went to, I was like, you know, hey, maybe someday. So uh, it, it's a nice experience. But yeah, I'm, uh, it's definitely different you know, context now, uh, and we are, it's different messaging, it's different thematics. Will there be hard moments ahead? Sure, of course, and will there be more political battles? Of course, that's the beauty of American democracy. If you look at the, if you look at the Adams Jefferson election, mm. it was one of the nastiest, George Washington was attacked. 
in the papers at that time. So the history of American democracy is full of it being tough. But that, that's part of what makes it great. So. so you came to New York, and this just goes to prove in New York you can be a new man. <laughs> you can make it anywhere. You can make it there, you can make it anywhere. That's not a Frank Sinatra. Well, and I was doing Hamilton. Hamilton. So in any event. Oh, that's a Hamilton? Hamilton's, I think, I think Frank Sinatra would Hamilton any time. <laughs> we may have to agree to disagree. In any event, let's thank for it.